In the world of corporate security, Microsoft is represented by two separate yet equally important groups. The security team that makes the rules and the engineers that break those rules. These are their stories. Oh yeah, I remember that kid. So he comes into my office at Microsoft just before supper time, I think it was. I'm working away and he comes in, he's like nine years old. He's wearing a suit and a tie and he's carrying a briefcase. He sets the briefcase on my desk, looks at me, starts eyeballing me as he starts fumbling with the latches like he's going to show me the soul of Marcellus Wallace or something. So the curiosity got the better of me and I say to him, what are you, supposed to be a businessman or a salesman or what? And then he opens up the case to show me inside he's got an alarm clock and some sticks of hopefully fake dynamite. He says, nope, I'm a terrorist. Then he demanded candy. Hey, I'm Dave. Welcome to my shop. I'm Dave Plummer, a retired operating systems engineer from Microsoft, going back to the MS-DOS mm -hmm. and Windows 95 mm -hmm. days. And today, I've collected some of my favorite Microsoft security-related tales for you. Now, granted, that story about the kid with the briefcase was from at least five years before 9-11. And did I mention that it was Halloween? And that Halloween, back in those days, Microsoft folks then brought their kids onto campus to do their trick-and-treating? Well, perhaps I should have said those parts first, but... There's one other thing I have to address before we get started, however, and that is that protecting employees from actual harm is no joking matter, and neither is protecting important company assets. Being a member of a corporate security team tasked with actual asset protection is a noble calling, but that's not what we're talking about here today. We're talking about rules, sometimes silly ones, broken by employees normally just in the pursuit of getting their work done without a bunch of useless interference. Thus, everything we'll be talking about today will basically be where the unstoppable object of a well-meaning employee hits the immovable wall of a corporate security policy. And the thing is that some of these stories don't age too well because of the need for actual security following 9-11. All I ask is that you keep in mind that it was a simpler time when security was seen by some as an ineffective inconvenience, designed therefore to be subverted by the best and brightest among us at every opportunity. As for myself, I'm a bit of a natural rule follower because I was born in Canada after all. But the rule has to make sense in order for me to follow it. Like, I get that you can't recline your seat during takeoff and landing, as it would obstruct the row behind you in an emergency exit. But why do they still care when you're sitting in the last row? It's like, alive, dead. Alive, dead. So it's that kind of rule that attracts the scorn of the self-appointed experts like myself. In his excellent blog called The Old New Thing, Raymond Chen recently related the story of the confidential coffee maker at Microsoft. Back in those days, Microsoft and IBM had a joint venture underway to develop the OS2 operating system. Now, I went straight from MS-DOS to NT, so I never worked on OS2 personally, but a number of my good friends did. And rather than working on this collaboration hand-in-hand -hand at some centralized location, most of Microsoft's OS2 work was done in Redmond. While the majority of IBM's contribution came out of their facility in Boca Raton, Florida, usually nicknamed simply as Boca. At some point during the project, a handful, perhaps two dozen or so, of Microsoft's engineers went to Boca to serve as liaisons to IBM. During their residency there, the Microsoft employees would be under the watchful eye of IBM security. Now, my own father-in-law ran security for an IBM data center, and let's just say that he didn't really have a sense of humor when it came to security issues. There was a right way and a wrong way, and there was no such thing as close enough. His buildings had bulletproof windows and man traps and the whole deal. And I assume the security attitude at IBM Boca was similar because their security teams even tracked employee violations, in a database no less. Violations could be handed out for things like tailgating someone through a locked door or turnstile, which made for huge queues at the entrances every morning as each badge took several seconds to scan and authorize back in those days. If you left papers on your desk, well, that is a violation. Did you put printed paper in the regular trash? Well, that's a big violation. Forgetting to lock your file cabinet? Oh, that's a violation. Wearing shorts to work? Well, for some inexplicable reason, short shorts were a big security issue in Boca. I don't really understand why, but then I've never spent the summer in Florida. Various legends started to circulate about these security policies. It was widely held that any employee, Microsoft or IBM, would be dismissed after accruing six security violations. That was later refuted by one Microsoft engineer who openly admitted to having succeeded in hitting the mark. He said, sadly, six security violations did not, in fact, get you sent home to Redmond. I know, I tried. A variation of that legend held that Microsoft and IBM had for some reason contractually agreed that after a grand total of 10 violations, Microsoft would be required to fire three people. Now, Microsoft was 
By comparison, pretty chill about security, and the bokeh transplants from Microsoft struggled to remain compliant with all the strict rules and IBM procedures. It further turned out that IBM did not have the awesome fully stocked beverage lounges that Microsoft Campus did. In fact, there wasn't even a coffee machine available except for one vending machine that produced something akin to brown crayon dissolved in scalding dishwater. The Microsoft employees banded together to buy a cheap coffee maker for their shared office space, but it was soon discovered by IBM security who deemed any personal appliance with a heating element to be a fire hazard and an important security violation. Two demerits. Raymond's story notes that the joint development agreement between the two companies included a clause that the Microsoft offices inside the IBM location were sort of a tiny Microsoft embassy, if you will. Well, you couldn't run into one yelling sanctuary. Sanctuary! Sanctuary! Oh, why did I teach him that word? Anything marked Microsoft confidential could not be touched or examined by IBM. Soon, the Microsoft engineers had arrived at a clever solution. They obtained a large cardboard box and placed it entirely over the coffee machine. Next, they cut a big access flap in the front of the box so that you could reach in and grab the pot. And as the icing on the cake, on went the Microsoft Confidential sticker. With the box marked as Microsoft Confidential, it could not be touched or examined by IBM employees, even the security kind. The problem was solved and good coffee was had by all. The math on just how much more of a fire hazard a coffee machine becomes when run inside of a cardboard box is left to the viewer as an exercise. Meanwhile, back in Redmond, those of us who stayed behind to hold down the fort weren't taking things much more seriously. Our IT security people, affectionately known around campus as ITG, had a number of policies of their own, but they were of course mostly about data and accounts. One of the more frustrating was that you had to change your password every so often, perhaps every 30 to 45 days. And so began the war of escalation between ITG and some of its users. The reality is that you're far better off remembering one secure and complex password than having to formulate and perhaps write down a new one every so often. But this policy was from a time before that was commonly accepted wisdom and so you had to change it. Naturally, many employees then just changed the right back. To prevent this, ITG started recording the hash of your last password so that you couldn't just change it and then change it back. Which of course meant that you needed a temporary intermediary password, but you could still do it if you were willing to change it twice. ITG then spotted this behavior and attempted to thwart it by keeping a log of the last 10 passwords. After all, nobody would be so hardcore as to change their password 10 times, at least not very often. And yet these were developers, so soon scripts started to circulate amongst the team that would cycle our password through a dozen temporaries and then settle back on your preferred password. I can only imagine how many people accidentally or carelessly stored their domain passwords with complete access to the source code tree and products, mind you, in Outlook VBA scripts so they could conveniently repeat this process every 90 days. Now, I don't know Steve Ballmer, and in fact, I've never even met him, so I know nothing about him as a person. And he does take some heat for the years he stayed on after Bill the CEO, but I'm still a huge admirer of what he was able to accomplish in the company's early years and for the passion and excitement that he brought to the company. My only real exposure to this was at company meetings, and each summer back in those days we still had one big all-hands meeting with 10,000 of us in attendance. Dana Carvey and Kevin Nealon would host as Hans and Franz, and they'd interview Bill as church lady and maybe introduce Carlos Santana as the musical intermission. It was a fairly lavish production, as you can imagine. Now at the time, I was fresh out of college, and even better, I was all the way from Saskatchewan, where we took road trips to places like Fargo, North Dakota, for vacations. Put more simply, I was not very cosmopolitan yet, and I was fairly blown away by the first company meeting or two that I saw. In fact, rather than just telling my young wife about it, I decided to try to sneak her into one so that she could witness Steve's insanity and Bill's vision at least one time on her own. In those days, we had card keys that had photo ID, but it's not like there were peel-off verification holograms or anything. In fact, they couldn't even be scanned or swiped, which is another way of saying they were fairly easy to forge because they were almost impossible to validate. I had access to a color copy or a work, those things could get you into a lot of trouble in the 90s. When we got our first such example in the copy room at work, one coworker naturally tried to copy money, but the machine smartly refused. That might seem easy now, but in the 90s we were curious, how did they go about detecting it, we wondered. He found that it would copy one half of the bill but not the other, and so he kept bisecting the bill until he found out precisely which part of the bill the copier was IDing and balking at. Spoiler alert, it's the treasury stamp, or at least it was back then. The Secret Service definitely has no sense of humor though, and they likely fear a million people printing one note as much as one person printing a million notes. You can do hard time for copying even a single note, so don't play around. 
When the day came for the company meeting, my wife lined up at a different bus in order to not attract attention from the people that I worked with who might otherwise recognize her. She was handed a little brown bag lunch of sun chips and talking rain, and she boarded her bus. I was fairly nervous and had been for days, and even knowing that there was virtually no chance of being caught. The card key looked solid to me, and there was no way they'd inspect it in the first place anyway. She merely had to show it to get in. If caught, it didn't have her real name on it, then she can run really fast. We went in separately so that she could just leave if she got questioned, but all my worry was for nothing. She said they didn't even look at her badge. She just walked in like she was supposed to be there, and nobody questioned her. Just like her dad always did when he took my kids to the movies. Sometimes, however, there was more at stake than just being busted sneaking into a corporate morale event. The acceptable use policy on the corporate land, of course, was serious business, and for good reason. We didn't want to leak secrets and source code for one thing, and you can't have employees visiting nefarious or inappropriate websites from their company desktop. Setting up a torrent server on the fiber backbone would be very bad form, for example. Accidentally bridging the internet and the corporate LAN or routing packets between them was seriously verboten and an actual cause for dismissal, or so the legends held. Which was all fine with me because I didn't want to do any of those things. All I wanted to do was surf the wear sites for cracks and serials and key gens and other cool stuff. Not out of some morbid curiosity with software piracy, but in fact, out of a direct connection with it. I was, at the time, the dev manager for the first version of Windows product activation, and as such, it was literally my job to find, understand, and then take countermeasures against the primary vectors of legal copies for Windows. If someone made a key generator for product activation, for example, I needed to know about it, how it worked, and so on. It actually happened one time, but because we were on top of things, we were able to analyze the key gen, devise an algorithm to detect its fake keys, and then shut them down at the back-end activation servers within a day or two. The problem with websites that feature wares, cracks, serials, and keygens is not just the piracy aspect. It's really more that those sites tend to be supported by advertisements that consist primarily, well, of, uh, like naked people hugging, if you know what I mean. Sometimes more than two at a time, even. And the last thing you want is to be sorting through a list of product keys in a meeting with your boss when a pop-up from 69orama comes alive with sound and video. That's why I said the only way I was going to do that side of the job was if I had an agreement from somebody in charge that it was okay for me to be hitting those sites from my company desktop. I didn't want to get fired on a contract technicality by somebody in a suit that found out I was just doing my job. I reached out to either legal or HR, I forget which one now, but in a day or two I had a rider for my employment agreement that gave me carte blanche to access all the porn on the web. But even back in those early days, the legend held that there was already more porn out there than any one man could use anyway. Now, if you know a little bit about Microsoft's history and its campus, then you know why Building 7 remains so secret. But there's one area that's so secret that most people didn't even know it existed. It was a large secret storage room for secret stuff that I still can't tell you about, even though it was long ago in the old section of campus, the single-digit buildings. There was a fellow in charge of the secret stuff in G99. We'll call him Walt. Somewhat reminiscent of Boca, even Microsoft's security was not allowed into G99 without Walt as an escort. Security had been trained for years to avoid G99, and that went back much longer than Walt had even been there. One day, he received a call saying that there was electrical work being done, and they wanted to pass some conduit through G99. Walt said, sure, you actually caught me at a good time. I can meet you right down there. And so he headed down to meet them at G99. But then nobody showed up. Walt reported that he were at the door to G99, and so were they. But they couldn't see each other. Long story short, there were two doors marked G99 down in that basement, and security had been dutifully avoiding them both for at least a decade, but they actually went into different rooms. The training had always just said avoid G99, so that's what they had done. And had no idea what was in the other G99, so security retrieved a master key and they opened it up. Inside, covered in an inch of dust, was old hardware, old products, manuals, everything. Fortran, Cobol, Masm, as far as the eye could see. It was a complete time capsule, likely left behind inadvertently when some other group back in the mid-80s was disbanded or reorged. If you enjoyed these tales of Microsoft Security Theater, I actually ran out of time long before I ran out of stories. So make sure you subscribe to the channel, because if it gets a good response, I'll release the follow-ups. In the meantime, check out some of my other episodes like Why Are Blue Screens Blue? If you did find this episode some combination of interesting or entertaining, I'd be honored if you would consider subscribing to my channel. If you have any interest in matters related to autism, Asperger's, or ASD, please check out my book on Amazon, Secrets of the Autistic Millionaire. Now, it's got nothing to do with money and everything to do with living a successful life on the spectrum. It's everything I know now that I wish I'd known back then. Remember, I'm mostly in this for the subs and likes, so please be sure to leave me one of each before you go today. In the meantime, and in between time, I hope to see you next time, right here in Dave's Garage. Do it, Glenn! Do it, do it!